and we're live. John Reed, Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio, I call it, even though it is video too. I got Matthew Sweezy. How are we doing? Doing great, John. Thanks for having me. Man, I have been looking forward to this. Um, we are going to really get into a very interesting debate, I think, on AI and personalization. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, how marketing needs to change, why it needs to change. And th there's some very interesting background to all of this between Matthew and myself, because um, it all started with this podcast called the Electronics Propaganda Society podcast, which I think is one of the best pieces of B2B content ever produced. Um, so I want to really ask Matthew a little bit about that and then also how your ideas have evolved since then. But it, very few people in the marketing field actually provoke me into thinking in new ways. So this is a very rare thing, uh, <laughs> but I'm glad you're up for this kind of dialogue. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to chat about this stuff. Um, cool. Yeah. So let's do it. Excellent. So uh, just, I want to get a disclosure thing out of the way because my, my show was really dedicated towards amplifying independent voices, but, but Matthew actually works for a vendor who's actually a partner of our Salesforce. So just want to be upfront about that. Now, having said that, if Salesforce knew Matthew was on my show, they'd probably be mortified. So it's not like I'm getting compensated for this. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, but I, I got to keep my job too, John. No, absolutely no. I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure this will be great for your, uh, for your job, job stability going forward. But, um, but anyway, um, the the thing I would say to my other vendor partners, if they're like, oh, we'll have us on, I'm like, well, first create a piece of content that dramatically changes my thinking, like Matthew did, and then see if you can come on for an hour and not even talk about your brand, and then you can come on. Um, now, having said that, I probably will ask Matthew a little bit about Salesforce because there's a couple of very interesting things going on there um, that pertain to our discussion. And I really want to ask you about this whole thing about outcomes versus experiences that you're pushing into now. Yeah. Um, Cause my guess is that a lot of our debate reflects thinking that you've already moved on from. So I got to be a little careful about uh, overthinking a lot of this, but anyhow, we're also going to have Matthew do countdowns of his top five uh, CX misconceptions and also uh, things that we should all be aware of in the CX market that we're probably underestimating. So I'm really looking forward to all this. So, Matthew, just for starters, like what what makes you tick? Like what 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 makes you passionate about this topic in the first place? I get asked this question a lot, and I think the best way to explain it to people is I'm one of those weird people who had a quirk as a kid and who fell in love with something as a child and followed that line because that's what I really love to do. Um, so, I mean, I've loved marketing as a thing since I was a child. I had my first business when I was a very little kid, fourth grade. Um, made my first business cards and flyers and I was in third grade um, to like, you know, advertise my, my pet sitting business, which didn't necessarily like, you know, <laughs> take off, but yeah, whatever. I just, I've just always been fascinated with this. And I think the reason why I continue to be fascinated with it is because I think it has a very interesting dynamic because it flows together. There, there's an element of media. Um, so how does media affect this? There's um, psychology, um, there's decision-making processes, and then there's the creative element of things of beauty, which I really love. I love art. Um, and so I think the combination of those th three things have always just made marketing a fascinating topic to me. And then I just want to push it forward. And that's kind of what I, what kind of drives me. Well, and what's, what I think is really interesting is that, you know, I, I knew absolutely nothing about marketing when I was younger. And frankly, I would still be screwed if if marketing hadn't changed um you know because you know what i'm good at is content that's the only thing i've ever really been good at and you know i think marketing shifted so much where it used to be so much about buying attention um and, and having catchy taglines that resonated and there's still an art to a good tagline and stuff but now mm -hmm. i think especially in b2b there's such a fortunate emphasis on on, on relevance through, through content and making a difference in people's lives. And that's frankly, Matthew, that's what saved me. I don't know. Otherwise I wouldn't be having this conversation with you right now about marketing. So. Yeah. I love, I love that we can all create. I think that's yeah. one of the, the greatest aspects. I mean, we talk about it extensively in the book of just, that's one of the big things of this new world. I mean, like one of the questions I'm proposing to a lot of people is if you want to have a fun, if you want to think a little future, futuristic, little, little far out, just ask yourself one question. How will Generation I totally change the media landscape? So first definition is what is Generation I? Generation I is what I'm calling Gen Z, um, but specifically those members of Gen Z, because if we ask Gen Z, what's the number one job you want to be? You know what their answer is? Influencers. 
Yeah. So absolutely. what happens when we have an entire generation of children who have the desire and who have the skill to create content? And then we add on top of that, the technological landscape when they come of age. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm waiting. We should, we should do a pool. We should, we should have everyone throw in $10 and pick, pick a year or pick a month. When's the Oscar going to be won by a 12 year old who made and produced it on their home computer? Right. It's not far away. I mean, we're what, two years away from that, maybe three? Yeah, especially if we keep hanging out at home like this, it's going to really, really give, give an advantage to, to folks who grew up doing it. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the Electronic Propaganda Society podcast because um, I just thought it was such a stunning piece of content. And now when you did that, you were what I didn't quite understand when I first listened to it. It, it was a short form series of nine episodes. Mm-hmm. And it, it was designed, I think, in your mind to set up the book that was coming out on the context revolution. A- am I correct yeah. about that? Yeah, it was set up to start testing narratives and start um, kind of getting the conversations moving and see see if there was any violent reaction against it. Uh, which I kind of had, but but I think only because you were trying to be provocative in in that in that podcast. If if anyone hasn't listened to it, I strongly recommend it because. Just the whole way you approached it from just a production values standpoint and, and so forth was just really powerful. And and even though I had in some ways a violent reaction to some of the concepts, um, I loved that experience of clashing with those ideas. Like like one of the things you said in that podcast, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I can't imagine a world where there's no websites and you just have a conversational like interface or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that scared the bejesus out of me because like I make make a living on websites and stuff, but but it, but it was an example of just like the provocative nature of that. And I have a lot of pushback around the role of AI and all of this mm-hmm. and and stuff like that. But we can talk about that. But I, I I really like that. And then when your book, The Context Marketing Revolution, came out, you really fleshed out the ideas in that book successfully in such a way that I kind of changed my views a lot because then I understood that you were you were intentionally being provocative, right? I mean, that's what you were doing in that podcast. You weren't trying to answer every question. No. Um, yeah. And first off, thank you for listening to it. Uh, thank you for you know gushing and, and saying great things about it. It was a massive project that I undertook and I, I did it out of love and I did it to prove to the B2B world that you can do something totally different and that you've ever thought of before. And at the current point in time, you know, going back to that point in time, I think it was interesting because, you know, blogging or excuse me, podcasting was starting to kind of come up. Um, you know, it, it, I think we had the first, you know, reports on like podcasts as a medium. And, and really what I saw a lot of people doing was from a B2B standpoint, which is it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, there. But I saw a lot of people using podcasts as a way to backdoor into accounts they wanted to sell to. They would make a podcast and then they would just reach out to the people they want to sell to. And that's how they would break into those conversations because who doesn't want free press? Um, and it was just, you know, just what I wanted to push the bounds on was the medium of like, hey, guys, like you can make something radical. You can really like use this medium and do something phenomenal with it. And all I did was just look at what was phenomenal in the marketplace. And to me, that was, you know, like serial and, you know, and like, you know, Malcolm Gladwell and Seth Godin stuff. So I just combined those ideas and, and made my little baby. And then I love propaganda. So I kind of gave it a little, little yeah, push. it had a cool underground vibe. Right. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and I think like part of the interesting thing there is just what a lesson for content producers in the corporate world, right. Where there was so little mention of your employer, like on that, on that pod, podcast, but the whole point was that you began to engage in those ideas and mm-hmm. eventually those conversations can certainly lead to more commercial conversations, but you really left those out, which I thought worked very well. And I wish more B2B content producers would take a page from that and give that a try. But Yeah. I mean, it's, that's it. We can talk about that all day long. Cause that's the battle that I fight. We all fight. If you're a content creator and if you're, if you're a creator, you want to create stuff that's beautiful. You want to create stuff that resonates. You want to create stuff that's, that's loved, um, that makes people think, you know, that w- w- why we create, right? Because we're creators. Um, and then there's the flip side. There's the, we can't, you know, art for art's sake or art for business sake. And so it's the same thing as, you know, any artist in the seventies who was, you know, a painter and a phenomenal painter and having to, you know, paint cigarette ads, um, you know, so it's kind of the, the flip. So we've got to make sure that there is value back to an organization for this, 
for this work. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's oh, what I'm ahead. pushing on is saying that, that we can deliver value because in this new world, it's about creating things that people love. And if you do that, that's how you build the brand, you know? And right. so it's like, you know, it's, let's make things that people love. Um, and by the way, that podcast was like the number one most awarded creative podcast for in B2B for that, for that year. So mm. um, you, you can make phenomenal stuff that resonates really, really, really well without ever talking about yourself. Exactly. Uh, and on that, we fully agree. Um, I don't want to get into our AI debate just yet because I want to responsibly present um, some of your ideas first. And um, the argument I'm sure your thinking has evolved, but the argument you made, it all began on June 24th, 2009. So you mm-hmm. can you tell us why you picked that as such a dramatic churning point? Yeah, so I didn't pick it. Uh, math picked it. It's a mathematical equation okay. that determined that day. Um, so here's what happens. One of the big questions I wanted to answer was, this is one of the original things that kind of got the book started. I wanted to ask the question, how much would it cost to break through the noise in the future? Is it going to be more expensive, less expensive? How do we do it? Well, one of the ways we have to answer that question is you have to first off know noise and we have to be able to compare what did it cost in the past? How much was it? What did we do? How did, we, how did it work? So I started tracking noise um, from 1900 and then projected out all the way to 2030 with pre- pretty basic linear methodologies, right? Not, nothing too crazy there, right? Just tracking stuff. And then what I did was I started to notice that noise traditionally is looked at from a singular view because only in the past was one side creating noise, i.e. brands, right? They were the only ones in the limited media era to create cat, to create content. You had to have capital to deploy content. You had to have capital. Um, so those are the only people that had enough capital to do it. Then when we look at this new world, what I started to see was all the individual you know, consumer created content, content that you're creating, content that I'm creating, content that my sister, my niece, my family creates, right? A whole nother world. And when I separated the two things out, And when I started to measure business generated noise versus consumer generated noise, and I looked at the equation as to when does consumer generated noise actually become a greater or larger factor in the environment than business generated noise, that day was June 24th, 2009. That's the actual day that individuals became the largest creators of noise in the marketplace. All right. So, uh, hey, and hey, Thomas, I sorry I didn't bring your your daughter in there, uh, thirteen and eleven. Um, yeah, well, let us know if they can get some award ceremonies going pretty soon. Um, but but yeah, I, there's there's certainly going to be no restrictions age wise uh, <laughs> coming up for that. Um, Brent, we're not going to argue just yet, man. Um, but but we are going to get there. I just have to. I don't know how much we're going to argue actually, but but we're, I want to really get his ideas laid out first, and then we'll we'll see. Um. So, so, so then, um, in, in the context revolution book, which is actually such a, uh, dense and interesting book that I had trouble processing it for a while. I had to take my notes. Um, you, you're kind of building on that argument and you're talking about a world of infinite media, mm-hmm. um, which is a very prov- provocative question for if, if consumers are shaping their own experience, then how do you break through and motivate them? Right. I mean, that's really what you're ultimately getting at there. Mm-hmm. And, and so you talk about why context is so important to, to, to that whole notion of breaking through. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you talk about the, in the book, you define five different elements of content and I'll just run through them real quick. You talk about available, permissioned, personal, authentic, purposeful, and then the book kind of goes through and outlines a lot of what those are and, and how brands should be thinking about context. What else did what else did I miss there? And I'm sure your thinking may have evolved a little bit since then. But but is yeah. that an accurate summary? Yeah, I mean that's that's the framework. Um, kind of like what it what makes the context of a moment. But I think the thing that I want people to listen who are listening and following along to understand is what I'm talking about in the book of context and, and what, what what my definition of context is. It's not don't read my book and come away with this to say how do I take what I'm currently doing and making it contextual? That's not what I'm talking about. In fact, in the book, I argue against modern def. I, I say we need a new definition for the word marketing because the old definition was made for a different time. So I think that's one of the big fundamental underpinnings is, right. you know, a lot of us don't get super nerdy. I get super nerdy. I mean, I worked with Marshall McLuhan's son and grandson on this because I love media theory and because I believe media theory. And for those of you that aren't familiar with media theory, what it essentially says is that human behavior is most 
it, it's dictated by the media environment that they live in, right? How we access information, how we can express ourselves, how we connect with each other. So really what the word context means isn't how do you take what you're currently doing and make it contextual? It's how do you understand that the new world that we operate in, what breaks through is what's in context of that moment. And getting in context of that moment is something totally different because those moments are created by other people. We're having to learn how to become a part of these moments rather than what we traditionally were, which we were talking about at the beginning of, we were really great at spending a lot of money and making catchy taglines. And mm. in this new world, it's how do you relate? How do you get into the point of personal, right? How do we take that to the apex? It's, it's past one-to-one. It's not mm-hmm. one brand message to one person in one time. It's how do I get one person to deliver the message to another person on my behalf? And that's the context of this modern world. Right. And, and so, and so, so far we have this understanding that, that it's become a very, very noisy world when it comes to content. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that creates dramatic, dramatically problematic things for brands. And, and also we could probably add that, that buying your way into that world is unbelievably difficult. It, it's not that it can't be done. You can certainly throw money at it, but, but even the cachet of the, of the Super Bowl ad is not what it once was. Um, so, so buying your way in is a lot more difficult. Um, and, and then, and then to your point, um, you know, how, how does, how do marketers respond that basically this is highly disruptive to marketers. And and I think so far we, we agree on all of, on on all of that. That's sort of the framework. I think we have any issues with that. Um, now, now since the context revolution, I know you've been doing a lot of additional research. Um, has anything fundamentally changed in, in your views since that book came out or, or are you just kind of building on that framework? Uh, I'm kind of building on it, but I, one of the big things that I wish it's always like, you know, you, it's like, you just got to get the book out as you're writing it. You know, it took me four right. years. It's just, I constantly wanted to add and add and add the, the biggest thing that I think that I would have loved to have really made clear was the notion of co-creation. Um, in, in this new world, we have to learn to work with our marketplaces in those moments. And I talk about that through a, a very specific lens of purpose and, and how we work with people to deliver purpose. But I think that's just one of the big, if we look at what is a future business skill, I don't see a business succeeding in the future that doesn't have a skill of co-creation as a muscle that they use as an organizational discipline to align to the market across the entire customer journey. Right. Okay. Now let's get, now Brett, you wanted some fighting. I I don't know if we're going to fight, but let's get to some of the things where I think there's some dangerous implications of some of your ideas in my view. Um, dangerous in, in a sense that people need to pay attention and think through carefully. So um, one of my issues that I think we can talk through a little bit as we go is I see some important distinctions between B2B and B2C and how people buy things that is important because the end game is you're trying to ultimately sell stuff um, or, or at least that should be a, a happy byproduct <laughs> of, of your work. Um a, a considered complex B2B purchase that takes place over time in a consensus type of way is so different than a lot of consumer-based purchases where you might be able to get me on an impulse trigger buy if you send me the right message in the right moment and, and then you have a sale. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and in the consumer world, of course, you can also manipulate people into buying stuff that they maybe shouldn't or should take a step back from as well. So there's some dark arts here, I think, that can come into play. Um, and, and they can be very effective sometimes. And, you know, I, I see it on Amazon all the time where it's like, they're cleverly recommending different things to me and I'm getting tempted. And, you know, it's sort of the equivalent of like walking down the grocery store aisle and like you're tempted by stuff. Um, so, um, I, I, I recognize that there's a little bit of a danger also in making a hard wall between B2B and B2C, mm-hmm. but I do see some differences between complex purchases that take place over time versus impulse purchases and how, how context can be used. Um, And I don't think that's a criticism of you. It's just more of something that I try to flesh out because I'm in the B2B world for the most part. Um, But the sec, but the second piece that I want to get into is I think that this notion of context is very interesting because my context in your context and everyone else's context changes moment to moment, you know? And I think the pandemic has brought that to light so much, you know, like an hour ago, I was thinking about my Oracle article, but then we were having a comment login issue. So now I'm distracted by that. And then maybe I'm looking up Google help documentation, but then I get a text from my mother and she's going in to get her vaccine. My context, my immediate context is changing all the time. 
And so my concerns are this. If if brands take this message the wrong way, they're going to overspend on AI solutions that are expensive, that guess at context, it, which I think is almost impossible given how quickly people's context changes moment to moment. And I don't think, especially in B2B, that guessing at context with AI is the way to go because ultimately I'm, I'm going to come back to the things I care about, but you can't possibly guess my context all the time. I don't care how you try to do it. You're not going to. So, but I don't think all those are your ideas. I think it's just how they can be interpreted. So what do you think of that? So I'm going to I'm going to pick on the B2B and B2C thing first cuz I have some interesting right. thoughts on this. So first off, I kind of disagree. So here you go, Brent. I kind of disagree on this notion of that they're vastly different. They're only vastly different in one real regard and that regard really changes the differences of both. And it also changes lots of things, which is the amount of risk in the decision. And so if we really look at any decision the greater the amount of risk, the longer the decision takes. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter if you're an individual buying something or if you're a business buying something, because let's look at two scenarios. I'm an individual and I'm going to buy a car. It's expensive because of the amount of risk, because it's going to be a significant portion of my total deployable capital. It's going to be a massive risk for me. I'm going to take a very long time yeah, yeah, yeah. to make that decision, unless I've made that decision before and I don't feel the same amount of risk in that second decision, right? So there's sure. the difference from a repeat and an initial. Same thing on B2B. If I'm a B2B right. organization and I'm going to make a decision for the first time, let's say I'm going to buy a new piece of technology. Yes, because there's a significant amount of risk, there's going to be multiple people involved because we need to look at all angles, right? So now you have a buying committee. You're going to have a much longer buying cycle because, again, of the risk and who's involved in getting those people together. So I don't necessarily think that it's a difference of B2B or B2C per se, but rather a difference in the amount of risk in any given decision. I um, mean, so to right. me, that's the underlying factor. Well, I I, I, I agree to a point, but I think uh, Thomas says, isn't B2B also more complex? I, I don't know, Thomas. I mean, I think you can have some very complex consumer purchases. There's almost no way to get this in shorthand because I just did a piece on, on our website about how certain low-end B2B sales can be highly automated. Um, but, but, I, but I do think there's a difference between when you, when you analyze a B2B purchase that's bought in a consensus committee type of way, mm -hmm. the, the strategy for influence, in, influencing that decision is wildly different than influencing an individual consumer who's making a complex purchase. Now, now of course, you might want to try to influence that person's spouse, maybe, uh, if they're buying a car, right? I mean, that, that's, that's an obvious thing where you might want to try to figure out how to involve their spouse in that conversation. But I think like that, that's a thing. And so I'm not necessarily saying, oh, they're totally different. Um, but I, but I think just in general, thinking so, about a, com a committee oriented or consensus based decision is really, really different. Let's play this out in the future, right? So let's look at a future landscape and the same argument, right? So what does a buying committee do in the future? So Thomas says more people are involved, more politics buying cycle. I'm going to throw an alternative out there, which is there's no buying cycle. Because what we're watching, and John, to your question earlier, is about research. So just got done doing some research with a colleague of mine, um, Karen Manji, and we looked at how has COVID essentially affected consumer experience inside of the B2B space. Now, we looked at a large scope, but let's talk about the B2B space. We're talking to enterprise software vendors who are so efficient at delivering outcomes from an individual customer that they're telling me, we are considering going to market as a freemium model and not even going through the traditional sales channels because we can so efficiently deliver an outcome at the smallest level and walk them all the way up to the highest level of the outcomes that they desire. So in that scenario, there's no risk to trying it, but the outcomes you want are delivered. In that scenario, buying cycles don't exist. Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm willing to concede that in the future, B2B sales process could look a lot, lot more like B2C. Um, right now, however, a lot of the big ticket ones, when you want to talk about the Oracle's work days, Salesforce's SAPs sure. of the world are, are complex. And, and that's the subject that Diginomica focuses on. Now, having said that, I don't disagree with you. And in fact, I think B2C in so many ways has been profoundly influential on all of our expectations around B2B, including our user experience, mm -hmm. it, it, it goes without saying that it should eventually influence our buying 
cycles as well. So I'm not going to disagree with you, but I am going to say that right now, I think there are some useful distinctions that can be made as long as you're careful not to overgeneralize. And I don't want to do that. Um, but let's, let's move on now to this next point, which is like, I, I don't look at you as someone who overhypes artificial intelligence. And, and, and in my mind, I actually do see a lot of benefits in, in attempting to personalize. But what is your, your view on this thing around, like, is it possible that companies could get carried away with using AI to try to predict someone's behavior? I mean, so often I see this stuff like pop up for me. It's like, oh, I just bought the last piece of luggage I want for the next three years. And now I'm seeing luggage all the friggin' time. And like, and I, and I think about this from a brand perspective where when you try to guess at my behavior, so often it backfires because instead of making me want to do more business with you, I start feeling like you don't even know me at all. You're just taking stabs. Uh, in, that, in that scenario that you just gave, I and mean, that's a basic retargeting play. Um, and I think all the statistics on retargeting are, are pretty clear. You know, f- once you show something four times after that, it's negative brand externality uh, in a retargeting play. I think the difference here is that human plus computer equal better outcome. So if AI can help us identify who and identify the moments where, we then go back to the human and help the human still talk about what is human in that moment, right? So we use AI to make the connections. Um, not necessarily deploy the exact experience. In those scenarios, the human picked the content and it was a pretty you know, ill thought out experiment, but that's, I mean, that's the tools they're working with. You've got probably mm. one marketing manager at, at that company, maybe two who are running that and who are essentially just trying to pull all the strings together and have to create large scale programmatic programs, which is if person does X, then show Y. I'm um, in an unlimited scenario. I can only have so many things since that's kind of the outcomes that we get. Is it ideal? I agree with you, no. Um, but in the future, what what's AI's role in that? Mm. There's, there's lots of possibilities. Um, there's possibilities right. of each person has hyper-personal media. We, we already have DCO, decentralized content objects, where pretty right. basic. I can throw in some meta tags on a pair of shoes, on some offers, and depending on what, the AI you know, resource that offer. But that's only the beginning. Like there could be some AI that comes out where it's, you know, I land and I don't see the same website you see at any stretch, which is already true for most things. But to the extreme of may not be a website, maybe who do I talk to is different. Maybe the actual image is generated on the fly and the copy is generated on the fly. I mean, because that's what is it, GTP3? Um, we're getting into now where it's like I can just basically type in a couple of characteristics of what I want and AI can totally make a landing page or an email mm-hmm. or anything that I want out of that thing. So right. there's the possibility. Yeah. And if you, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's interesting because like I have Amazon devices all over my house and I, what I worry about with, um, with, with vendors around this stuff is it's just, it's so easy to spray and pray. And, and I don't think they sweat the collateral damage of it. And it like, so like in all the four years I've had these devices, they have yet to offer me up a relevant suggestion that really feels personal to me. But all the time, I'm, I'm, it's stuff like, oh, uh, if you like, I can do this alarm for you at the same time every day. Like when I ask it to like set an alarm. Never mind the fact that I never get up at the same time every day. And they have the data; they know that. But, but they're just kind of fishing. And I think these fishing expeditions are really costly when it comes to trust. So, even if the technology gets to the point where it can predict stuff. They, people have the brands have to rein in the temptation to just blast stuff out because it's so efficient to do it digitally and say, well, we got a 60% response rate and who cares about the 20% that didn't like it or didn't respond? It's not like they're going to unsubscribe to our devices. So that to me is one of the dangers of trust here. Uh, you and me agree on that. Um, what do we do about it? That That's a whole nother question. Um, so yeah. the question is, you know, I argue for marketing transformation where we re- rethink the role of marketing. We decentralize it. We move it into the key customer moments. Um, we give marketing people more autonomy. We remove a lot of the red tape of approval. Um, we move into advertising that's super fast. Um, so I think there's there's new methods that we can come up with that get us past that. But I think one, it's as we talk about, so going back to the core notion of the book, I want people to realize marketing is a game. It's, there's not a truism. There's no There's no truth in marketing. There are only the specific games that we play given the environment that we operate within, right? Think about that. With that, that so many of the truisms that we know of longstanding of how we organize, how we operate, they're they're irrelevant now. We're, we're just stuck in legacy process with legacy education, moving ourselves out of that into a new world. That's what we're currently doing right now, right? And yeah. so 
this is one of those things that we have to do is break out of that old legacy idea, that legacy process, um, the, the legacy notion of all I need is one person in technology to scale this messaging out. Um, that's just, you know, one iteration past. All I have to do is pay a bunch of people to put my message everywhere. We just took that in house. Now we need to rethink how do we actually relate to people in different ways? Um, and how do we use this new environment to meet them in the context of that moment in the context of what, what's possible? Right. Um, I just real quick, I want to get back to Thomas's question. Uh, you, when you were kind of describing this, this sort of like the B2C purchasing, influencing B2B, like the cultural changes, have you run into sort of the changes that companies are taking to become more like that? Yeah, I mean, companies are, are moving quickly. I mean, COVID was an accelerant for all types of, of what we yeah. would call digital transformation, which, I mean, un underpins a couple of major things. One is decentralization, moving out of silos and moving into concentric circles around key moments of the customer journey. That, is a, that happened. Um, talking about a shift from experiences to outcome during COVID, that happened, right? People are doubling down on outcomes and moving past just the notion of basic experience measures. Um, so, you know, they are changing the way that they think agile, a lot of people already knew about Agile, but what changed was organizations didn't have a centralized Agile language. I mean, we never thought we needed one, right? It was just like, you're Agile, go do what you want. All I care about is you're moving quickly. But the problem is, is when you decentralize, if product uses a different Agile you know, flow language setup than marketing does, when you put those two people together in a room, they don't have a centralized process to utilize and they revert back to a waterfall process. So there's a whole nother thing of we need to start thinking about maybe we need to have a centralized language and maybe that is specific to each. I don't know how I, there's lots of questions we could we could discuss, but I think those um, are Thomas is saying there was no speeding up of digital transformation. Most companies did just did digitalization of processes. Thomas, you did a really interesting blog post on that. Uh, go ahead and post that in the chat if you get a chance. Um, I think Thomas is right. There were a lot of faux transformations, but I, I do tend to agree that the pandemic accelerated these these trends. Um, one thing I wanted to get to here, because I think this is sort of at the heart of, of my critique of not necessarily your ideas, but how other people interpret them sometimes, which is, mm -hmm. so work with me on this B2B, B2C thing, even though you hate that distinction or don't agree sure. with it. Um, so in, in, a, in a B2C shopping context, let's, let's say that I'm on Amazon mm -hmm. or I don't even have to be on Amazon. It could be on your website. You have a Shopify shopping cart. That's fine. Your your goal, you, you probably know that you can get me to buy something the first time I'm on your site. Um, so you're spending a lot of time trying to understand in the moment what, what it is I'm looking for. And I think the methodology described really makes sense as far as like the more context I have on what's on John's mind at that moment, the more likely I am to trigger a purchasing behavior um, and earn John as a customer. But the model that I prefer to B2B is a little bit different, which is which is in B2B, what I prefer is more what I call the opt-in community model, which is, okay, I have someone on my website. Um, I know that they might not come back for a long time, even if they're enjoying the content. And the reason is that people get distracted. They're very busy. But what I really want to do is I want to earn, I want to earn their way into my community by sharing things of value with them. It, it could be content. It could be tools. They could free tools. They could use freemium options, whatever. Um, but I want to draw them into my community and I want to go through a value exchange process of earning more and more data from them. Um, they might subscribe to weekly newsletters. They might subscribe to a podcast. Uh, I, I, I know pretty much they're not going to buy something right away. And in fact, this person may never buy from me at all but they might be someone that influences purchasing decisions that used to be hostile to my brand, but now they're not so much. Um, I want to really bring them into my world. Um, now, I know you don't fundamentally object to these notions because your, your employer does such an amazing job of doing this, and we can talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to me, what that does is it takes a lot of the stressing out of like, what is John doing in this moment? Like, doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm subscribed to your community. I'm bought in and I'm basically giving you permission to continue to contact me in the future. So why do you have to worry so much about what I'm doing in this moment and spend all this money on AI to try to decipher my moment? You don't have to decipher my moment. You've already earned my loyalty or you're going to. So what do you think of that? No, I, I mean, <laughs> if we go back to the the framework and what I say is the apex of personal, which is human to human, which is exactly what you're talking about. And I think that plays in B2B and B2C. Um, but just in the context of B2B, because we want to talk about that, 
I, I, a thousand percent agree. I mean, it's there's no reason not to. Um, first off, when we go back to that word context, when you have those other people, that's the context of how other people want to get information is from other people, right? Mm -hmm. We have to get out of this idea that people want to hear from brands. They don't. They want to hear from each other unless they just love your brand so much that they want to consume like Red Bull. Great example, right? Like very, very few people have that type of relationship with their audience. And they cultivated that through that value exchange. Um, but to, to your point of human to human connections, that's exactly what B2B has to do. They have mm -hmm. to move out of this world and they have to start figuring out how do we work with our marketplace? How do we work with our audience to create things that they find a value? And then the offput of that is so many phenomenal things. We start mm -hmm. to watch out one is first party data acquisition. So now we have all right. these different things now start to produce first party data that we can use to model and go find other people, right? And as well as we can use that to model omni-channel experiences. Number two, we then have the ability that those things produce their own content, right? So mm -hmm. removes the burden of us thinking that we have to create all this content. Because that's one of the knee-jerk reactions when I talk about infinite media. Someone says, well, how do I create enough content in the future? And my answer is, you don't. You you work with the marketplace to create that content for you, um, and it doesn't have to be what we think of as traditional content. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. It could be communities. It could be ratings and reviews. It could be uh, just goodwill. I mean, like one of the phenomenal things that happens out of the Trailhead community is just watch how many people post when they get new badges on social channels, and how many other people in their personal network are all congratulating them on that. Mm -hmm. We're not a part of that conversation. We facilitated that conversation and that's as far as we go past that. Everyone else is taking that conversation forward and talking about us because of them. Right. So that's the context of how we play in that moment. I'm not listening for what that moment is. I helped facilitate that moment to happen. Mm. Right. That's kind of what I want people to kind of think about is how we think about context too. Right. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and so, so in, in that though, I just I just would like to help B2B companies understand that they don't have to invest so much money in trying to guess what I'm doing in that moment mm -hmm. with technology that really is is hit or miss with that. It's it like you can own the moment in a different kind of a way. Exactly You're not right. going to own all my moments. Mm -hmm. But then the question becomes, I guess, what is the role of AI in all of this? And I have some answers for that. I, th I think there are some roles. But the vision that I just described to you doesn't really require AI to be successful at all. Mm -mm, um, it doesn't. Now, now but, but the question does can be added now, which is, can AI help facilitate some of that and make it even better? I'm open to that. thousand percent. And to me, that's... I think the biggest play for AI for a marketer is to help them make better decisions, right? It's to help them know where to deploy their time, right? Where, where should I focus now? What should I do next? Where, where should I be going? I think that's one of the big things that AI can answer. And then the second is just making everything more efficient, right? Like it's just, we're never going to get away from large scale mass efforts, right? We're still going to receive emails that get sent to an entire database. We're still going to have um, yeah. advertising. We're still going to have these math methodologies. AI can make those better. Um, but to your point, it's not the only way to make them better. And let's give a really, I don't know, have you read any of my work about fast advertising recently? No. So here's the concept. This isn't B2B, this is B2C, but here's the question, right? How do we have a personal relationship with a significantly large target addressable market? Let's go with 100 million people, right? So if we go for, we want to have a personal connection. There's the idea of, well, we would need to have a one-to-one -one relationship. It's very difficult if we are a CPG brand because we just don't have enough of a, per, of a person's life. We're a consumable that has very little share of their time or their attention. But we can use a mass methodology in a new way, which is rather than creating one ad like we talked about with glitz and glamour that's trying to convert you to buy the thing or build a brand that goes on for you know six months, what if we were to change that methodology and change those ads every week and have them hyper-personal to audiences where we now have a conversation with the audience through that mass methodology? So it's a totally different option. That does that allows us to then have those one to one or at least pseudo one to one as best we can at scale. And to your point, AI is not doing that. That's human methods um, right. that that allow us to scale that. So, do you consider yourself an advocate of hyper personalization or 
are you more like me and a critical of whether that's actually possible right now? It depends on how you want to define it and depends on yeah. how you want to use it. Right. right. So it, once we start going down the, the, you know, the, the keyword bingo, it's like is, is zero party really first party or just did someone want to try mm -hmm. to sell a new technology with it? Um, so the term hyperpersonal, we're currently working on a big project of hyperpersonal and it, it's for most people, to me, the word hyper is a little bit kind of misleading because um, mm. really, I think what a lot of people are talking about is just using a couple of basic data points to just make sure that you're personalizing past just a subject line and a first name. It's making sure that you're you know, personalizing the experience or what we would call omni-channel journeys. That's really what hyper-personalization really means to a lot of people. And is that powerful? Yeah. If you have an omni-channel experience, that's powerful. We have all the data. Everyone's got it. We all know that those things work. Should we invest in hyper-personal without the understanding of experiences first, without the understanding of what we should be driving to with an outcome? If we just buy the technology and think that if we just make the things more personal, they'll be better, that's a failed path. Mm. The path that we have to go down is to say, how do we use this technology to help people accomplish the goals that they have in those moments? If we do that math, that is a positive outcome. Yeah, and, and I think where, I, where I've been pushing back a lot on this, like in general, is just because... Like, so I had an argument with a web designer a while back who was telling me like, cause I was telling him that we only want data on our readers if they want to give it to us. Um, beyond a point. I mean, obviously certain things we don't mind knowing, but he's like, oh man, with, with this thing I can put on your site, like I can tell you everything. I can tell you where they live. I can tell you, I'm like, I don't want to know that because like, and, and, and so to me, like that's sort of why I'm kind of, pushing hard on this is it, it's not really you it's just more the ideas that get provoked by this because it's like like it's a silver bullet people think it's a yeah. silver bullet and it's not and it's the dark arts too because some of it is possible but but my argument is especially in b2b or in what you might have if you want to prefer to call it you know riskier purchases um like you need to earn people's trust um to to accomplish your goal of getting that purchase and 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 the data exchange should be based on perceived value, um, but but I fully acknowledge that for impulse purchases in particular, you can get people um, with some of these techniques. I totally get that it, it mm -hmm. can be done. I just I, I'm worried about it, and I just I just want people to understand that that you that that all this stuff around predicting behavior and stuff. It's like well, build a frigging community first, and and then figure out. <laughs> the technology you want to layer on it. I mean, the, I have a quote from, from you that came from one of your books that I, I I've just been struck by again and again, which is, um, let me see if I can like pull it out here. If I had it correctly, it was, um, it was a stat around the impact around, um, the trailhead communities here. Let me find it. Oh yeah. Um, customers who complete the onboarding program and join the trailblazer community, including trailhead buy on average, twice as many Salesforce products and remain customers four times as long, producing significant overall increases in Salesforce and user adoption and lifetime customer value. That's powerful stuff, man. Yeah. And, and go back to, so if we're going to tell that story, you need to make sure you go to the reason why we do this community in the first place. The reason why is, is when we ask customers what they want, going back to the key values that we can provide for them, they want better business outcomes and they want better personal outcomes. It's not rocket science. I want to have a better career and I want to have, a, I want to do better in my role, right? So what we did is we created a community that helps facilitate that. It does that, right? So there's the educational aspect, which is when they get badges and the learning management system. Then there's the question and answer where people can ask and answer each other's questions. And it, it's not rocket science, but you know how many other people do it and do it well? Very, very, very few because they don't have the organizational discipline to invest in those things. Because the executives, going back to, I believe the question earlier was, you know, what organizational disciplines do we need? The number one key difference between a high-performing marketing organization is executive buy-in to a new idea of marketing. That's where it all starts. If your executives right. can't get past the ideas that they've had, and all they want is you to renovate their old methods with new technology, to your point, if you have a bad foundational idea and you add phenomenal technology to it, there's the old adage, which is still true of the best way to ruin a business is a great advertising campaign, mm. right? If you have a bad business and a bad product and you have a great ad campaign and you drive everyone to it, you just put yourself out of business. 
same concept. You know, if you're going to have a bad theory and a bad strategy and you're going to up level that with a lot of highly powered technology, you're going to have a not so positive outcome. Um, and we've seen this, right? So it's like, you know, when people get new technology, if they don't, here's, I'm going to go on a soapbox for a second, John. So for a lot of people that don't know me, you, you've never seen me before. Um, the last startup I was a part of, I was employee number 13 in a little company called Pardot. And we grew that up and it became, you know, one yeah. of the significant marketing automation players. And I wrote one of the first books in the space. So what happened was when I was going and helping people understand how to use marketing automation, he, here's the problem. They'd never had this technology before. And, and when I say this technology, it's not that marketing automation technology. It was if then, it was Boolean, it was programmatic. They had never had the ability to do, if someone does this, then do this. That was completely new to the organization. And it's a phenomenal technology that could open up so many other strategic doors, do so many other problems and do so much stuff. What did they do with it? They took all the old things they knew and just automated those old things rather than saying, we have new possibilities. What can we do with those possibilities? Now that's human nature, right? So, it, you know, it's human nature. We've done this. Anytime you get something new, we apply it to the old until we have enough learning to build something new with it. But that was the big thing, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people buy these new, bought that technology and didn't obtain the value that they thought they would simply because all they did was automate all their old bad practices rather than trying to evaluate and ask the question first, should I still be doing this? And then two, what should I be doing other than that? Right. So, and, and, and there's, there's one thing I just really wanted to um, emphasize is because it's not in your context revolution book, but it's something that you pulled out from research pandemic era research is the shift from talking about experiences to outcomes. I think this is really, mm -hmm. really important because marketers have really hopped on board the experience train, oh, yeah. um, which is another train that I have tried to derail in various <laughs> ways. Um, but, but tell us about this shift and why it matters. Uh, so first off, I just got an email that there's an article going up on Diginomica on Tuesday on this topic. Um, so if you want to go back to Diginomica and read that All right. on Tuesday. Um, so here's what happens. We asked a bunch of CXOs and I, I already prefaced this earlier. We asked them, how has CX changed during COVID? Um, and really what happened was everyone said a couple of the following things. We've moved past experience and we're now focused on outcomes. So let's kind of break this down and what this means, because it's pretty knee jerky. Um, and I don't want people to misconstrue the words that I'm saying, because it's not that experiences don't matter. I'll push back on you. Experiences matter and they matter a significant amount. Here's the problem. People don't necessarily understand what an experience is, first off. Number two, they had the idea of the wrong idea of experience. And then three is they were considering that if all I did was make a good experience, that all the goodness would flow from that. And that's not necessarily true. So here's the quote I want you to wrap your brain around. And this comes from a chief experience officer. We have happy customers with great experiences leave all the time. We have unhappy customers with bad experiences stay. The differences are the outcomes that they receive. If a customer has a bad experience, but still receives the outcome they want, they stay. If a customer has a great experience, but doesn't receive the outcome they want, they leave. It's not that experiences aren't important. It's that an experience that doesn't lead to the desired customer outcome isn't important. And so that is the big thing that we found. Now, we start to get into tactical aspects of this. They're, they're shifting the metrics. They're looking at not time to value over NPS. Um, MPS has lots of problems. Everyone that, that looks at MPS probably knows those. One is cultural. Um, you, you ask people in South America, you're going to get a different answer than if you ask them in, in the Nordics, than if you ask them in the United States. Culturally, we answer these questions differently. Um, secondly, if my MPS goes up by a factor, mm -hmm. my revenue does not instantaneously follow by that same amount. So there's the squishiness factor, the subjectivity of it. Uh, there's just so many aspects. And, and then you know, if someone asked me, like, would you recommend this pen? Like, I, I don't recommend pens to anybody, right? So mm -hmm. it's a silly question. Um, so, you know, people are now looking at time to value. And so that was kind of the big shift that we looked at. Thomas uh, says, uh, agreed experience without outcome is nothing. Um, by the way, uh, you guys should definitely check Thomas's and his his posse. Their CRM convos show is always worth a look. Um, so track Thomas for more of this type of talk. Um Unfortunately, we don't have time for a total experience debate uh, because I already squandered our, a lot of our debate time. But um, and I, I don't think we would probably end up disagreeing too much when we finally got to the end of it. I mean, um, 
I, I, I think what I have pushed back on it so much is, is, is first of all, because it's just idealized. I mean, the experience economy was the most influential marketing book that I ever read. So I, I do believe in some of the aspects of it. Um, and, you know, until I probably, until your book, that was, you know, that that's a second notable marketing book I've read in, in all that time. And it um, should be noted that that book was one of the leads into my, I work, I worked with uh, Joe on, on this book. Absolutely. And, um, but, but look, I mean, one thing I've said again and again is that consistency of experience is vitally important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, part of that is a pushback against like, oh, I delighted this customer. It's like, yeah, you delighted this customer and then you screwed up their reservation two days later. Um, and, but, but, but I also think like, like to your point, like outcomes are so important because what happens these days is we get locked into all these kinds of loyalty programs and stuff. And I'm not going to bail on that program because I had a bad experience. I'm locked in. Um, and lock in is both good and bad, right? It's bittersweet. Uh, it can be great for, for my wallet and it can be great in other ways, but it can also be problematic, but I really like you shifting this to outcomes cause that totally makes sense. And I probably can be persuaded on the experience terminology as long as we can recognize that efficiency is a, an, an experience. Um, because sometimes all we want from a brand is an efficient transaction and, and, and nothing more. Um, and as long as people will concede that point, then usually I don't get into big arguments. <laughs> so a positive experience is through the lens of the customer, what the customer right. wants to, uh, that's the positive experience. You can't define it. Yeah. Uh, they, they, the, the problem that most people have is they never asked what that experience is supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and, and, and I do think you can compete against transactional experiences, by the way. Um, you know, it, it's one way to compete against the Amazons is finding a, a different experience that isn't as transactional perhaps, but anyway. Um, so we've gone through a ton of stuff. I, I do want a yeah. chance to get to your countdowns. Um, All right. Cause, cause you worked on those. Um, we may have to blast through a little bit of that stuff, but I do want to get to it because um, I don't know what you're going to say and I really want to hear. So um, let's start with um, your, uh, the snarkier countdown. But first, before we do this, I just want to just briefly give you a round of applause for uh for being willing to be such a good sport and foil for those questions um I, I really enjoy that back and forth um so let's hear about your top five misconceptions of C cx you can give them in any order you want top five all right first off experience is the end all be all we just talked about that so that's misconception number one yeah um Misconception number two is most people just put CX as the back half of the buying cycle. It's not what customer experience really should be. We should be looking at this through a holistic lens. Um, so that's misconception number three. Um, number or two, number three is an experience is not a single thing to your point. Um, most people to your point also go back and say, I had a great experience, but it's usually a combination of lots of things that end up with something that's great. Um, mm. And th that notion of what is an outcome Again, an outcome is not a singular thing. They're usually orchestrated across lots of different moving pieces and parts to produce um, mm. the idea outcome. Uh, number four, most people don't know where the, the notion of experience came from. That really kind of bothers me. And to your point, the experience economy, everyone I think should have read that book by now. And if you didn't, you need to go read that book. Um, it book totally changed the way that I think about the world um, yeah. in, in a phenomenally powerful way. Um, and then I tried to build upon that. Um, and then number five, oh, I think I forgot my number five. Well, we got four. That's good. Take me back to the one about the second one was like the back end part of it. What was that yeah. one again? So see, actually, I mean, when, when I use the term in the book, chief experience officer, there's tons of people now with the title of chief experience officer. But when we talk to them, most often they're just dealing with support and service. Um, that's the second half of the buying cycle, right? So post sale is usually what CX is now. I don't believe that's what it should be. I think that's just the evolution of customer of customer success. Um, but I think if we were to really say customer experience, we should look at the entire life cycle and kind of apply the experience lens to the entire life cycle, not just the back half. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a debate point that I have with um, with Barb Mosher Zink, who contributes digital marketing content as our lead author for Diginomica in that area. She talks about how we don't think enough about serving customers throughout the so-called life cycle of the customer. And, and, you know, 
I think there's been more welcome focus on that because of the SaaS industry, right? Where customer success has become this framework that helps us to think about that in a better way. I, I talk so much about kind of the initial phase of using content to earn trust, just because I think brands are so terrible at that. <laughs> brands are particularly terrible at, at, at talking about stuff that isn't about their brand. Um, um, <laughs> yes. So, so I, I tend to hammer away at that point. But there's all kinds of other stuff that that folks need along the way besides that. So, yeah, I mean, we could talk about that point of yeah. brands need to learn to talk about conversations past themselves. That's a, yeah, that's absolutely. A I mean, I think that's one of our areas of most violent agreement. Actually, yeah. um, I noticed the audience has been a little quiet today. Uh, perhaps you're a little bushed from the week. Uh, it's been an eventful week on Diginomica. I'll get into a little bit of that when we close here. Um, but uh, if you been uh hopefully riveted by some of the back and forth here feel free to pop in a a view or two because we're going to probably wrap in i don't know the next 10 minutes or so so if you have anything you want us to cover please do um but uh i gave matthew some more homework so i don't want to miss out on the opportunity to uh hear his top five most overlooked elements of great cx i'll be really curious to see if there's any that we haven't covered so far uh, you probably covered them number one uh the employee uh, the employee's involvement in customer experience. Um, mm. You know, Tiffany just did a lot of good research. When I say Tiffany, Tiffany Bova, um, one of my colleagues just did a phenomenal research project looking at essentially the ability of EX to impl- um, be the one of the catalysts of growth for an organization. Um, so that's mostly overlooked. Um, number two is is the experience is the end all. So going back is that, you know, the experience is not the only sole focus. The outcome should be the focus. Number three is the customer. Um, so, so too many times, I don't, we rely on things that we know and we try to scale everything. And this notion of talking to customers is often tried to scale through surveys and these other methods. I just think it's lost that we actually talk to people and have a system of talking to people um, rather than a system of, you know, deploying surveys. Not that surveys are bad. It's just, when was the last time you'd filled out a survey and we're like, damn, that was a great experience. Um, Mm, You know, so I um, overlooked, um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I got, I, my brain's fried. It's the end of the week. Oh, uh, no, sorry. dude, it's, it's fine. That's good. I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss any. Um, I had, a I had a piece, um, I, I was trying to call it up now, but it was, it was something along the lines of the survey epidemic is upon us and it has to be stopped. Um, you know, it, it's like every time I pick up something around the house, I, I get a survey, you know, if I get a smart toothbrush, I'm going to get a survey every time I brush. How was your brush tonight? Oh, it's great. Um, and there has to be a more organic way of of getting information out of people. It's just there's going to be a point. Maybe it's just me, but I'm going to break someday. There's going to be if I break and just kind of blow a gasket, it's going to be because I was sent one survey too many. <laughs> it's because your for, toothbrush asked you a question. Yeah, I'm like, come on, man. But anyway, I think that's really good. Let me ask you about this employee experience thing briefly, mm-hmm. um, because I think I I, I've, I really strongly agree with that. And I think like so many times I've had debates with retailers around um, this notion of how how can you possibly provide these exceptional experiences to customers when your employees are disgruntled, underpaid, dissatisfied, uh, poorly trained and poorly equipped with the kind of information that the consumers they're serving have. Um and I don't always get good answers to those questions. I mean, think about I think about Amazon. I don't want to just pick on them, but Amazon, in in my area, they they've displaced all the UPS deliveries with their own network of gig economy drivers who are basically driving madly around my neighborhood, like racing to deliver as many packages in a mechanical Turk volume compensation model as possible. And whatever experience I have receiving the package, they don't even care. They don't even care if it got to me as long as they can show a photo to Amazon that they left it somewhere. Um, and and to me, that's that's problematic. And and yet that's what we run into sometimes with these behemoth companies that get away with, sh- uh, in my mind, shortchanging employees. And yet it never shows up in their stock price. Um, so so what do we think about all that? Uh, um. <laughs> There's a lot to that, John. Uh, so let's, let's start <laughs> yeah. with the basics. So the basics is when you have an employee that's empowered, 
they create better experiences. And, and so as we start to think about how do we have these operational um, efficiencies in the future, and as we talk about things such as decentralization and giving people more autonomy and more power, that's how we move faster and do better things. It's not through more control, it's through less control and more mm -hmm. trust. Now with that, you then have to empower those people, right? So that means you need to provide them with the correct technology, you need to, to provide them the correct, bait, the salary, come on now, like, did, my aunt's a frontline worker in a grocery store, right? It just kills me to no end when I drive by that store and they say, and this is during COVID, we love our heroes. And then at the same time, they pay her the same, right? right. So it's like, no, you yeah. don't, right? So don't, don't tell me that. Um, so I, I just right. wish they would realize, I mean, I thought we had this big conversation of like, you know, they're going to be the golden employee. Like they're the one that has the actual touch with the customer. We're going to start treating them different. We're going to start empowering them. Like, right. Yeah, do that. Come on now. Let's do that. Um, but, you know. Yeah. Wouldn't the hope be that somehow, quote unquote, AI and automation can finally lower some of the cost models so that they really can spend more on what they perceive as the humans that are left in those environments to really invest in those humans? So there might be a few less of them, but at least they're invested in them more. I mean, it seems like that's one way out of that rabbit hole. I don't know, but. Could be, but my answer to this is look at Chick-fil-A, right? They're the most profitable fast food company. They're mm. growing faster than anybody else. And then they charge more money than anybody else. And they pay their employees more than anybody else. Mm. The notion that you can't pay them more and make more money and be financially profitable and successful in the stock exchange is not true. Um, it's totally right. true. And, and we see examples of it all the time. Well, Chick-fil-A don't think is publicly traded. Um, right. But, you know, that's that's the point, like when you treat them well and then we have the research now that shows, you know, and I think the number is one point eight X, like they grow at one point eight X the rate of those that don't do these things. Um, so that's just I don't know. And, uh, and 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 finally, are there any um, companies that really excite you as far as I, I know that your message is a pretty strong message that a company can't adapt to what you're saying overnight? Um, are there any companies that you kind of look to for inspiration these days of like, wow, they really are getting this doing it? I mean, I wish I had an answer for that. Mm -hmm. I just have, I, there's, I have like my crush brands and my crush brands are not necessarily because they're following my, what I think or what I do, but yeah. they are like, I mean, I'm right now wearing a pair of Cotopaxi pants. Um, so I write about Cotopaxi in the book, um, I love what they do. I love everything about how they operate as an organization. Um, I love just uh, to me, like they do so many things well. Um, you know, there's other players in, in spaces uh, and I'm trying to like, you know, not piss off my mm. company by saying there's other companies that I think are doing some things better yeah, than yeah. we are. And so I can't, but, but there's lots of players and um, th that I love, you know, there, there's a, a email company out of Atlanta who I, I think has done probably one of the best jobs at branding, um, in a B2B space that I've seen in a very long time. Um, mm. So human, they're so human and they're a phenomenal organization. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a couple, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, I, I think your experience echoes my own, which is that I do have brands that I'm passionate about, but I don't know that I hold up too many as like shining examples of like, they get all of this stuff. I think it's more like they well, get some of it or they yeah, get a piece of it. Or that's, that's the hard part, John, is I've never seen someone that does it all. And I think that's what people need to realize is that my job is to look at a wide lens and see all of the things that are going on and say, if you want to do this, this is the best way to get there. But going back to that point is marketing is different for each organization, depending on where you are in the marketplace, what you're selling and how you operate, right? The game that you play is different and you're never going to do everything. So just focus on a couple of core things that matter to you and your market and then just really excel at those things. Um, mm. but to the, to going back to your point, I've never seen someone that did not knocks it all out. Yeah. So just real quick on your example, you, you said you're you referred to a company in the South that, that is, you said so human. Um, yeah. what, when you, when you use that as a compliment, what, what does that mean? Because I think I'd like to leave our audience with that, 
notion of how, how do you, if you're a B2B company, how do you become more human? I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, it starts off with just getting past this notion of we think a corporate buyer is a corporate buyer and relating to people as humans and not just like a persona of XYZ. What kills me is every time if I go into an organization and try to help them and they're like, well, you know, executives don't want that. They're not going to look at this. That's silly. Look at our branding. We have cartoon characters as a prominent brand that we put multiple, multiple, multiple millions of dollars behind a year and people love it. Right. So it's this notion of get past these very strict and rigid ideas of what B2B can be and learn to relate to people on a human level. Right. Like change up. You can have a brand that is fun, that is lively. You can do things that aren't super corporate. You can talk about things that aren't just ROI and how to use your product. Right. You can be very human. And to steal a quote from one of my good friends, Mark Schaefer, it's the most human company that wins. Mm. Yeah, that that resonates with me completely. So I kind of put you through the ringer today, but I but I thought it was a really amazing conversation. Um, did you have anything you really wanted to express that we didn't get to? Or no, I, I thanks for having me on. Um, I think it's funny you're wearing a Woody Guthrie hat. I don't even know if people know who he is anymore, unless you're a folk singer. But I had someone, you know, I had someone ask me that the other day, like who is he? But that's that's good, right? I mean, yeah. You know that this is how this this goes in this world. Like you got to pass it on a little bit. This marketing Still. land is is your land. This marketing land is my land, John. Well, absolutely. I mean, we want to trace back the history of these things, right? Um, like we discussed with the experience economy and how so many people haven't read that book, and yet yeah. it's found it's foundational. So, uh, Thomas, I'm really glad you you like the conversation. Thanks, man. This was probably my. My, my favorite show, even though I didn't really get the audience totally engaged liking comments, except for you, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, but this was probably one of my my favorite, if not my favorite, just because, like, I don't know, this conversation really gets in my jugular because it's all about, like, the opportunity we have, like you said, to be creators in this world and to, and to reach people in ethical ways that, that matter, that make a difference in their lives. I mean, geez. Mm -hmm. can't get any better than that but anyway i'm really glad that um that you are going to be publishing this uh outcomes on Diginomica next tuesday so folks look out for that yeah. and if folks didn't notice there's a pretty important announcement on Diginomica today because one of our founding partners den hallett is retiring so mm. um his thanks for all the fish posts as you would expect to do it to be titled is uh, up on the site now and check that out um, but it's been quite a journey uh, with him. Um, I had to update my LinkedIn profile because he and I have a video company that I never put a termination date on. And I started getting all these congrats this week for our anniversary. And I'm like, oh, crap, he's actually gone now. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's been an amazing bootstrapping journey with Diginomica. And it brought me to this point, to the conversation today. So thanks, everyone, for supporting the ride oh thomas is like what what's going on yeah thomas man that's big news man uh uh den how it's stepping down he he's uh riding off into the sunset have a look at his post for more he'll explain all the motivations behind it but um the gist of it is he's the kind of guy that pulls the plug when he still has something left in the tank and i think that's a that's a good uh role model to have i i, I think i don't think we should go off like choking on our fumes we should go off like when we're still rocking and firing on all cylinders so i don't know what you think matthew but that's my take on it uh, i think that's a good take <laughs> uh thomas says what a loss oh yeah i mean it's like uh yeah it's the end of an era i mean uh there's you know there's only so many voices in the enterprise that that have been as strong as his over the years but um all all things change and you know, change is inevitable in life. So one more change to roll with here. Anyhow, the conversation will be continued, but thanks a lot for your time today, Matthew. Appreciate thanks it. For thanks to everyone on. for joining and be sure to check the replay to catch the whole thing. Cause you don't want to miss how this all played out later.